We're getting to uh, welcome back one of our favorite R2C2 guests, C. And um, he is uh, definitely letting us know where his baseball allegiances lie. Come on, Jeff. Show us the shirt, man. Show us the shirt. <laughs> I feel like he wore the shirt. For, that, that shirt is for us, bro. Like, that, that's a question for me and you. Y'all yeah. still mad is what's, what it says on the shirt for those just listening and not watching on YouTube. Yeah, because I've heard enough about, like, how you your organization was cheated out of a possible World Series <laughs> bid. Enough. You guys got your own deals to worry about. You going to sign Judge? Steve. Come on. This is this is true. I mean, and we said we've said it like after they they swept the Yankees, there's nothing else to be said. Like it's over. You know what I'm saying? We we were closer to beating the, the Astros in 17 than we are 6 years later now. You know what I'm saying? So, it kind of well, is what it is. I don't know about you guys. I think the the Yankees obviously had a great year. The Astros are just they're just darn good. I mean, mm -hmm. they can pitch, they can hit. You know, um, I don't know why we got rid of our GM. I, that doesn't even make sense to me. But anyway, <laughs> I just, um, I just so happy for Dusty Baker. I mean, who yes. even Yankee fans have to be a little bit happy for y Dusty Baker. He's a cool dude. Absolutely. I think they are, Jeff. Like, and we talked about it. It was this weird feeling. There was kind of like two prominent feelings afterwards. One feeling like, okay, this validates everything the Astros were done for anyone who felt like it needed validation, right? Like even I feel like if those guys had any trepidation rock in their 2017 rings in the aftermath, they're going to feel a lot better about it now because like, Hey, look, we still want after all this. And then dusty, you know, this is a great baseball man who's been on the brink multiple times. And I also think, you know, he was obviously the perfect fit for the Astros, you know, both in what he was able to do as far as just, you know, helping them win games, but also what he was able to do in, in putting a, a, a reputable, respectable face back on the organization in the aftermath of what they went through. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, he, you know, I, again, I don't know baseball like you guys know baseball as far as moves and, you know, what he what he does really well. but. I know for for a fan, he was the perfect antidote to mm. all the negativity. He he didn't dismiss it, but he also didn't give it credence. He was just I thought he always struck the perfect chord. And um, even after they won, you know, just like he was happy for himself, but he was really happy for the guys, too. And I, I don't know. I just think he's like I think we all wish we could be like Dusty. That cool. That, like, you know, I want to be like Dusty. You know, I I feel the same way, man. He he is he is awesome. We had him on recently, and he was terrific. Um, he, you know, Jeff, did you go to the parade? No, I didn't yeah. go. Uh, I, I'm not a parade guy unless I was <laughs> on the like the the floats or whatever the cars. Yeah, um, yeah, that's the only parade I'd want to be at. But I, I tell you one thing. Uh, it was really well done and, you know, basically without incident, and, you know, a million people. I, how many did they get in when the Yankees won CCI? What did you guys get? Like a couple million? Oof, oof I don't even remember, um, I, to be honest. I, I mean, you, yeah, Ruko, uh, yeah, you were not. I, so I don't know. I don't know what it ended up being in the subsequent years. Uh, and I don't know what it was in 09. I don't remember. But I do remember very specifically that in the 1996 World Series parade, it was three million. Whoa. Um, yeah. So my guess and you cut is school. I know you cut school. <laughs> <laughs> so you, know, you, you know, you know, you're up to, all the way to the front, too. You know, you, you know what's amazing? I can actually remember not going to school, but not going to the parade, but watching the parade, watching the parade. at home. Like the day of the parade, uh, in uh, in either '96 or '98, I could specifically remember like sitting at home watching it instead I, of being at school. I applaud your parents for letting you <laughs> cut school to watch the parade on TV. That's yeah. <laughs> right there. You, you know what? What's amazing? Like my parents actually, they had great perspective during those Yankee playoff runs of like understanding these moments and memories. We're going to trump any one day of school. Of school. And 
I was actually recently talking with Andrea about this, like, because I was like, I don't know if you fully understand, babe. I, my best childhood memories, like, if you ask me, like, my top 20 childhood memories, like, 16 of them are associated with being at Yankee Stadium during those Octobers, during that run. Like, and if they're worried about school nights, I would have never been there. I went one time and... I never went to a Yankee World Series game, but I was there during the playoffs one year and I had tickets like about four rows from the top, right? So you're with the true Yankee fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was sitting next to these two sisters that knew more baseball, Yankee history. They were keeping the scorecard. They knew like, I mean, I was like, these people right now, if podcasting was back then, I would have jumped, I would have said, Hey, we need two sisters and a Yankee. That podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying the uh, overall so knowledge, yeah. like Yankee fans are like, yeah. they're devout, like devout fans. Yeah. It, it's true, man. And it's, spoiled. And spoiled. And spoiled. And very sure. spoiled. Very sure. spoiled. Oh. <laughs> you know, since we were talking about Dusty, Jeff, before we get into some of the specifics of, you know, what we've seen thus far for the NBA season, you told a story. I was very lucky. I got to work three my first three NBA on ESPN games this week, this year with Jeff. We had we had three straight Fridays together. Um, but you told a story. I think it was our last game, or no, two ga- No, it was the Miami game because Pat Riley was there. Um, about Pat and what he told you right away, and like the kind of the pillars of uh, of coaching. And I was wondering if you could share that here because I thought it was so interesting and and it sounds like uh whether knowingly or not probably a, a a model that would also fit with the way dusty manages a team yeah so uh, coach riley uh i had been there before with other coaches and coach riley kept me on and so after our first season together we lost in the second round to the bulls and he did something that um i'd never had done in coaching, which is like an end of the year review with the, with an assistant coach, you always do it with players, but this was with me as an assistant coach. And so, you know, the first question he posed to me was, do you want to be a head coach in the NBA? And truly I'd never thought about it. I'd only been an assistant. I was like 31, maybe, or I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, older. Um, But whatever it was, I was like, wow. Like I haven't even thought about it. I just love this job. And he said, well, if you do, I, I, I have two things for you. And he said, first, you got to dress better. Your clothes are terrible. <laughs> right? so, so he sent me, I didn't say this, Ryan, but he sent me to this Armani place uh, downtown because he was a big Armani guy. Yeah. And I looked at the prices and I wheeled and I got out of there, man. I was like, <laughs> that's not fair. Anyway. Then the second thing, and this truly has lasted me my entire life in basketball. He said, players don't care if you're big or or tall, played or didn't play, black or white. What they care about is if you're competent, number one, you know your job. Competent, sincere, reliable, and trustworthy. And if you're those four things, then players will want to play for you. And when you're, you know, five foot you know, eight, you know, was a division three player, you know, that was like truly uh, inspiring to hear. And I say it to any young coach, you know, worry about your competence, your sincerity, your reliability, and your trustworthiness, and everything else will come together for you. Opportunities will arise. And uh, I was a, a great benefit, benefactor of that. And I, when I coached, I tried to live by those four pillars. No, I mean, as a player, that's completely true. I mean, if, if you got a guy that you know he knows his job, whether he played or not, you can trust that what he's telling you is is, is going to put you in the right direction. That's all you want. And and by that, that that breeds confidence. I mean, the, the trustworthiness, right? Like, if you're competent, competent at your job and I know that, that, that you prepared, then I trust everything else. Whatever speech that you're going to give, whatever – Whatever you're going to tell us to do in a locker room, I trust that w- we can go out and be able to get this done. You know, and I, I think this other one that uh, another coach gave me, I would put in there with my fifth. Um, and that would be, I, the, I want the player to know that I want him to succeed. Like, 
truly know that I want everything that he wants for himself. Now it has to be within the team structure. And sometimes he's not going to get, you know, in your sport, every at bat he wants, but you know, that I'm truly invested in his personal success. And I think that goes back to if a player feels that I think then that goes back to, you know, the trustworthiness and sincerity aspect of it, because, um, I, I just think sometimes it's, it can be a, you know, the head coach or manager and player, particularly when they're not the star guys, it, it's so important that they know that you're as invested in their success as you were in the best player's success. I don't know. No, a thousand percent. I mean, that's, that's uh, for, for me, my, my favorite coach and best coach was Carl Willis. He was my very first pitching coach, but I knew that he was invested in like my career. You know what I mean? Like, off the field, on the field, we had all these different type of talks, but I just, you can, I, I can feel that he really cared about what happened to me. And we're still close to this day because of the, that relationship I started when I was 17 with him, you know? That's very cool. I mean, as a, from a coaching standpoint, um, hearing that type of story, that's, I hope you've shared that with him because that guy, like, that would make him beam because that's really truly why you started out in coaching. I mean, you, you never know. I mean, you never know you're going to become a professional pitching coach or an NBA head coach, or, you know, you just want to coach and teach because ultimately that's what coaching is, is teaching your mm -hmm. subject, which is whatever the sport is, but that you feel that strongly. That's very, very cool. Yeah. I, you know, uh, a couple of uh, years ago, Jeff, when I was doing a Spurs game, I asked pop, I was like, what, what do you still love about this most? And he was saying, he said, number one, the feeling when the ball goes up, like, I still love that competitive juice that I feel every game. He said, number two, I love seeing young guys lives change and feeling like, you know, I'm able to have some role in helping them. And he was talking about, I think, Maybe he was talking about Aaron Baines and the contract he got. Uh, maybe it was with Detroit, wherever he left San Antonio for. Um, and like him being like, you know, you shouldn't stay. I'd love to keep you, but like this is the best thing for your family and kind of the pride he felt seeing that change his family's life. And so as you are talking about this, I'm wondering, is there is there a player that comes to mind when you think about someone who like, you really felt like got that you wanted what's best for them and you saw them like maximize their career. Maybe they weren't, you know, an obvious, you know, future all-star, whoever they might be, but somebody who you're like, you know, you really got, you, you, you know, they knew that they, you really believed in them and you saw them kind of like have a real, you know, meaningful career. Yeah. I would say Charlie Ward. Nice. Like, Very cool. I I was an assistant coach with them. Then I coach him as a head coach. And then when I went to Houston at the end of his career, he came and he was to play, but his knee was too bad. Then he became an assistant coach. And Charlie's a man of few words. Uh, you know, now he's on commercials. I'm like watching. The <laughs> on commercials. I'm like, I just, I just texted him the other day. I said, dude, I, I can't believe you're, he, he sat behind me in the bus and uh, for every year we were both in New York, that had to be a decade together. And so my seat was third on the left. His was fourth on the left. And for those entire years, I think it was, this was how deep the conversation got. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, bring it in. You know, but, but, but because like, he came in, you know, he only played like half seasons in college because mm -hmm. bowl season took you to, you know, th they were always playing New Year's Day. This guy was a Heisman Trophy winner, national champion, and he he's playing in, you know, half season. So when he came to the Knicks, he was a late first round pick. And it was Monty Williams, who's now the head coach of Phoenix, Charlie Ward and myself on the court, basically, you know, the hour before you know, Riley's practices. So that's when they practiced in the NBA. It was like, we worked for an hour, they worked for three. And then, you know, like he was in the weight room afterwards. And I think um, he always had the intent. There's, 
you can't give somebody in, the intangibles of competitiveness, of uh, everyday like drive and you know all that sort of stuff. But you can't help him with his skill. And because he was so, he and Monty were so willing to work and work together, they both improved their skill level so much because they had the components. But I think Charlie, because we spent so many years together, then we coached together. And then at, even after, um, you know, he, he went back into high school football coaching here in Houston. And then now he's, he's, uh, uh, he just won the state championship in Florida in basketball. Like this guy. Wow. I, I don't think people realize, like I always say this, if I ever spoke at a camp, the greatest athlete in the last 40 years is Charlie Ward. Yeah, like, for sure. Heisman Trophy drafted, I think, by the Yankees. Mm-hmm. I think. I think that's right. Um, yep. Played 13 years in the NBA, has won a state championship as a as a uh, high school basketball coach, coached in the NBA. I mean, like this guy has done it all, all the while saying about 10 words, you know, like. <laughs> No, because his credibility with people, like just by his actions, you know, like that whole, you know, your actions speak so loudly, I can barely hear what you say. Mm. That That's Charlie Ward. And so to me, I think he absolutely. I, but also, I got to say, I knew he was absolutely committed to me as well, uh, trying to help me become the best coach I could become, too. It wasn't, you know, I think the best relationships aren't the ones that, you know, one is trying to gain from the other it's when you know you're collaborating working together so as much as i think charlie believed i was investing in him i also believe you know charlie and monty were investing in me um and trying to make me the best coach i could become man it's it's crazy because i think guys that are my age like my generation understand how good charlie ward was and you know me watching him grow like at florida state like you said win the heisman and then not really pick his best sport and then play that for, you know, like you said, 10, 15 years in the NBA. I mean, he could have went to the NFL and he would have been, he would have been a perfect NFL quarterback right now. You know, obviously back then they would have probably tried to turn him into a wide receiver or something, but you know, getting drafted by the Yankees and, you know, just inspired like my generation of, of athlete looked up to guys like Charlie Ward. When I was younger, it was Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders and these different guys, but as I got older into my teens, it was Charlie Ward who you looked at. Like, you play multiple sports. This is the guy you want to be like. And for him to, to you know, not pick his best sport and go out and have a great career in it was unbelievable. Well, he, he, he was very prideful. And he said, if I'm a first-round draft pick in the NFL, I'll go. And if not, I'm going to play basketball. Mm-hmm. And people tried, thought he was bluffing, and, and he wasn't. I mean... He, when you get to know him, you know he's a man of few words, but he absolutely means what he says. And you'll appreciate this, CC. So back when sort of semi-hazing, but really wasn't hazing, still existed, Coach Riley always put the rookies through what he called the gauntlet. So he would line up the veterans on in two lines, like with about like six feet apart, but maybe not even, you know, close. And he made the rookies run through the gauntlet and anything goes right. And, <laughs> and that's, and that's back when we had Oakley and Ewing and Mason. Oh. Yeah. It, the gauntlet should have been like, it, I would have rather run through Rikers than run through that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, Monty Williams is up first and I'm like, <laughs> he comes through and they are bouncing this guy around with blows that I, 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 I am just like, I'm worried for him. And he finally stumbles out of the gauntlet and, you know, he's big and strong. And so he recovers quickly. I'm like, before Charlie starts, I'm like, oh, poor Charlie. Oh, what's going to happen to little Charlie? Charlie came high stepping through like he was running with Florida State. And I saw the great balance and they were trying to hit him and knock him off stride. He just breezed through that thing. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't touch this dude. I was like, and it just showed like all the innate, you know, balance and agility, toughness, all those things. Like, you know, it, it was, it was beautiful to watch. And I'll tell you another thing that's beautiful to watch. We would warm up sometimes when I was the head coach, we'd break out the football instead of doing all that, 
stupid ass stretching. You know, <laughs> we would we would have like uh, guys run pass routes, and Charlie would throw to them. Oh, and he, uh, in a, in a gym, I mean, it was just like the way he just like literally threw it on the money and watching like some also how good some of these like players like Larry Johnson and Charles Oakley could move and catch. I mean, I'm like these guys, they're just, fin- all you guys are just freak athletes. I don't, I don't know how you do it. You know? No, you know, what's crazy about NBA players is that <clears throat> people don't give them credit for having great hands. Like oh, the mm. big man in the NBA, you got to have great hands to, to catch some of those dimes. Like, that, that they drop it, that they drop at you right at the rim, and so like some a lot of those guys have great hands. So I, I'm I'm sure watching him drop dimes to Charles to Charles Oakley was was insane. Yeah. Now Ewing's another thing. That, that guy couldn't catch anything. So <laughs> <laughs> that dude, yeah, he was, no, he, if he tries to say he was on the brink of being a tight end or a receiver, like yeah, he can say no, nah, that wasn't happening. <laughs> oh, that's great. What those are phenomenal stories. Oh. Jeff, how about, um, you know, watching the league thus far this season? I guess the first thing I want to ask, it, it doesn't have to be a team you've called a game for yet, but just consuming the league the way you do. Is there like a clear cut, this is the best team I've seen thus far this season for you? Well, I think Milwaukee has shown that. Now, they've had some injuries. Uh, you know, Giannis missed a game. Holiday's out now. Middleton hasn't played all year. Uh, but they're the best. They've played the best to me. But I think even more important than like who's the best team, there are so many teams that uh, everybody, including me, thought were going to be bad, like Utah, mm-hmm. who is excellent. Oklahoma City playing great brand of basketball. Indiana playing a terrific basketball. Um, there are some great surprises, and it goes back to depth. And guys getting more opportunity um, maybe to play and play well. And early in the season, uh, it, they've held those three teams to me are remarkable success stories. You know, I'm out west uh, on the Nets road trip and, and uh, doing Nets Kings. And that's a team, too. Like, you know, I look at some of the talent for Sacramento and I'm like, I mean, the way Keegan Murray looks so far, De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, you just realize kind of, Coach, there aren't a lot of, there's not like a lot of teams that you you take the floor and you feel like, oh, yeah, like this is a definite win. Like the talent feels pretty well spread throughout the league right now. Unfortunately, players still have that mentality sometimes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, because of, I don't, you, you need a big ego or an e- a, a sizable ego to be successful in pro sports because of all the, you know, the negativity that surrounds uh, players and teams and so much harder today than it was 10 years ago with the, you know, onset of or and onslaught of social media. <laughs> right. And yeah. so. But sometimes the ego gets in the way in thinking that, you know, You might not, Greg Popovich has a great term, you know, appropriate fear, you know, of, of your opponent, or, you know, you could say appropriate confidence. Um, But the term appropriate is, is a great term because sometimes, particularly when you win in the NBA, you get softened up and you, you do take for granted, like, oh, we could go to Orlando, you know, we'll win down there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Banchero is good. Wagner's good. And, you know, so you can get your head handed to you by anybody in this league. Uh, But ultimately you need, you know, the star power, enough shooting around the stars, and then a team that's committed to defense and rebounding. And that's why I like Milwaukee so much. Mm. I feel like I feel like Orlando is a trap too, because I feel like every time a good team is playing in Miami, they have a back to back in Orlando, and they always fucking lose. That. <laughs> they always lose. They always lose that fucking Orlando <laughs> game because the Miami game is either going to be tough where they went out all fucking weekend or whatever, yeah. and then you got to go to my Orlando and play the back to back. You know, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I, I never. I I still remember. I was broadcasting a game. Okay. Uh, 
in Miami. This is like a number of years back. <laughs> and the Celtics were a really good team back then. And so, but it wasn't in the playoffs. It was regular season. So uh, they played the game, you know, night game. And then Doc Rivers was keeping them, you know, they were staying over to, so they could get, you know, the, what the sleep doctors say, yeah. you know, we, we sleep here and then we'll fly the next day. Right. So I had an early morning flight. I left the hotel. I was in the same hotel as the Celtics. <laughs> I come down, I come down. I'm taking like a 7 a.m. flight. The Celtics are flying to get their sleep doctor rest at 10. Okay. I came down. As six guys were coming in, so, <laughs> that's when I knew the sleep doctor has not taken the Miami effect into account. Like, yeah. we're leaving after Miami. I don't care if we're flying, like, you know, I don't care where the, my organization is. We're flying from Miami. We're you know? leaving right after that game. Right after the game. We're not even showering. We're just going. <laughs> yeah. Right. There's certain cities where you just got to know. That rest isn't happening. Like it's, no, it's not it, happening. It, it I feel like LA's life. like that too, though. I feel yeah. like the Clippers get the Clippers and the Lakers get the back. The, the, the Nets just had that when yeah, they had the back to back. Yep. I feel like it's like a setup sometimes in those cities. I'll, I'll tell you what the real setup there is, in my opinion, is when you play the let's say either team you play at twelve, like on a weekend, and then you're not playing until like six the next day. Like you would think like, Hey, we could get all of our stuff done. Whatever we're going to do, we could get it done. Like and still be reasonable. And then you see the guys, you think like, have they slept at all? Like and the answer <laughs> many times is no. no. I still remember I, I was in the, we, we beat the Lakers one time when I was working for coach Riley and he, he looked at the guys after the game because he knew he goes, you guys have the West side of town. I've got the east side of town. <laughs> Carl at 11. Yeah. So that was it. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's you know, it's funny you bring that up, Jeff, because I, j I just saw it. I called both those Nets games in LA, like the day game against the Clippers, even though it was a weird early start. Nets had their legs, they had juice. Of course, they win. They have the whole night off. Then the next day, night game against the Lakers, they had nothing. They had nothing. I think in the NBA, it's the same when you're going on a back-to-back -back from like LA to Denver. You get in. I got in oh. one time. I was coaching Houston. I got in one time. We played Christmas night in LA, played the Lakers. And then they gave us a back-to-back -back in Denver. We got in at Ooh. like 4.30 in the morning. That's when, you know, they used to deliver the USA Today at your, at your, <laughs> your room. you yeah. read the USA Today before you go to sleep, that's a late <laughs> night, right? It's a problem. <laughs> so I said, and you know, it's like, you know, in Denver, it's like an hour from the airport to the, you know, yeah. to your hotel. Oh, yeah, it's brutal. Far. Yep. It's yep. brutal, right? So I think, I think you should have in the NBA two forfeits a year where you just, you know, like <laughs> that one should have been a flyover, say, hey, Denver. Hey, good <laughs> <you know? laughs> and, and that's what the Nets should have done with the Lakers. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you guys are three and ten now. Hey, yeah. congrats. <laughs> I think you're right. That's a way to do it. And you gotta think sometimes too, like that's their only time going to LA. So these guys have like like got that circle. Yeah. They look at the schedule before the season comes out. Like, when are we going to LA? Like what what does that week look like? So they have all that shit mapped out, trust me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coach, how about um you know, Boston and what they've still been able to do. They, I think it's seven straight wins. I mean, they've, they've looked like they haven't missed a beat despite, you know, not having Robert Williams, despite not having the added addition of Gallinari, which we thought they were going to obviously Joe Missoula taking over. What, what stood out to you most about the way they've come out of the gates this season? Well, offensively, they've been, phenomenal like uh not just tatum and brown but just team wide you know horford you know they're they're starting grant williams now so they're big and they're you know like jalen brown or tatum you're gonna have to guard with a two guard right so yeah i've just you know smart is a physical point guard um 
Brogdon, he's now hurt, but he, you know, he, he had had a huge impact for them early. And they have a bunch of like good players. Like they got the star power, but they have a bunch of really good players by them. Now, defensively, they haven't been as good. Um, I think Robert Williams, uh, his availability will be critical to them winning a championship. I thought they were the best team last year. Uh, they weren't able to play uh, that well in the finals. They had a great run up into the finals. Uh, and they're going to be right there. If Williams is help, healthy, and that's a huge if. You know, he's had a lot of knee issues. Um, but then I think they have as good a chance as anybody because I just think Tatum and Brown, their depth, and he adds so much to their defense. Mm. I think if Williams was healthy last year, they may have beat the Warriors <clears throat> at, the, at the end. Yeah. I, He's completely you, healthy. You know, and you know what? I, I when, when I was watching the series, before the series and watching it, I'm like, the Celtics are better mm. than the Warriors. And the Warriors, to me, what they completed was one of the most improbable championships. Um, because I thought their talent was, you know, okay. But... I think it goes right back to Steph Curry to this day. And I don't understand it is underrated. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, the, his greatness is just sometimes I think taken for granted and, and they try to t- siphon off a lot of the credit that should go to Curry to others. And, and like, you know, no one ever said to like, you know, Jordan, yeah, but he's got all these other guys. You know, like, no, Steph Curry has other guys. You don't win it all if you're not, a, you know, they're a terrific defensive team and they have other guys. But, like, when you look back at that, that guy drove that championship bus. And I still don't think he gets all the credit he deserves. And maybe it's because he's a nice guy or maybe because he's always giving credit to others that everybody just starts believing oh yeah you know he's i love when people say yeah he's really good but no no you can just say he's great and that's Mm. it that's Mm. the story i i actually along those lines jeff i it bothers me when people like are like he is the greatest shooter of all time and like end it there i'm like that's like one of the credentials (laughs) <laughs> of what makes him great, you know, like that. I mean, obviously that's a very, that's a very nice superlative to have. Don't get me wrong, but like acting like he's just a shooter is really, I think, underselling the impact that he has. There's no question. First of all, he's a, he, and when they say shooter, you know, usually you're, you know, people think, you know, three point shooting and right. You know, but what he has done is he's a great catch and shoot player. He revolutionized the game by being able to shoot off the dribble from the, behind the three point line. And then the depth of the three point line that everyone tries to mimic uh, now, but he's also a tremendous finisher. Mm, I mean, yeah. a tremendous finisher and people don't want to talk about that or don't get around to talking about that because they're, you know, so concentrating on what a great shooter he is. And then his movement without the ball, he's a tremendous cutter. He's in great, probably the greatest condition you could ask a guy to be in. Um, he is not a good uh, rebounding guard. He's a great rebounding guard. And I think he's improved his defense over time. Now, I think some people, you know, they had that crazy dude at media guy say about being, you know, all defensive team. I'm like, okay. I can acknowledge how much he's improved, but let's stop with that. Okay, let's stop. <laughs> but like he's he's unbelievable. This guy is unbelievable. And I don't care, you know, I know a lot of people like to do the, you know, he's a top, you know, whatever player in the game. I don't know where anybody would slot him, but I know this. He brings like in his own way as much fear to game planning as anybody who ever played. Mm. Pretty nice compliment. Yeah. It's also impressive to me when you can be th- the main hub on three different iterations of championship teams. Like but you pretty incredible when you think about the like the time spanning the titles, the different teams and him being the guy on 
on all of them is amazing. On all three of those teams. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's incredible. And, and also, you know, willingly sharing the spotlight with Kevin Durant when he, yeah. When yeah. He came, right. Like he wasn't fighting the notion of having another great player next to him and, or, you know, that proverbial idiotic question of whose team it is, yeah. you know, he, he didn't get involved in that. And I, I think, again, that's overlooked. Like, who couldn't fit in well with Curry? If you got a game and you care about winning, you're going to fit in well with Curry because I think Curry is an underrated competitor. I think he's got competitive greatness in him. And part of competitive greatness is the humility to know that you can't do it by yourself. And, you know, so I, I, I have so much admiration and you're right, Ryan, like, like he's been able to do it in, in, with different groups yeah. and last year's to me, I still don't know if they'll appreciate how improbable or what a great championship that run is until they see this, you know, there has been this, you know, slow dissolvement of like, like the talent, like because mm-hmm. of all the money being spent. Right. So yeah, and the aging process that's yeah. you know undefeated in the NBA, and so I think I hope the Warrior fan, hint hint, CC can <laughs> uh, really appreciate like just what a great run that is, and not be so disappointed in how this season has started. Like this could have been probably anticipated, maybe not zero and seven on the road, but there's going to be some struggles. Mm. I think Warrior fans are always grateful for for whatever winning they get or we get because they they were so bad for so long. And because a lot of fans, like I said, like myself, that grew up in the Bay Area, grew up L.A. Laker fans because they were winning. You know what I'm saying? Like, so a lot. So California, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, was a Lakers state, period. So I think the, the, the NorCal fans, I think the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area fans are forever grateful for what for what Steph and the Splash Brothers and Draymond have brought, you know, up there in championships because we had never seen anything like that, especially in Oakland. Like they had parades and you know winning championships in Oakland. Like that's that's something special and that's something that you know they'll they'll forever be legends up there in, in that region. You know, bringing championships to to that you know uh, group of fans because it is a, a great sports fan base. I mean, you got. 3,000 A's fans that show up to the game every it's the 3,000 but but those are the those are the guys that went to the to the Warriors games you know what I'm saying so those are the they, they are faithful fans they really are it's a it, even when they were losing or not even just losing like with bad teams but like when they were like good but not championship caliber stadium that is packed team, that that pace was rocking mm-hmm. and it was it was always a great place to play because the enthusiasm was real. Mm. Coach, I I, I want to ask you just about if you're the Nets now, feel free to sidestep the landmine that is the, the, the team that I, I call games for. But they're in an interesting place, right? Because they've started to play better playing better defensively, sharing the ball more, kind of using Durant as the hub of which everything centers around. Um, Jock Vaughn, who's you know just such a phenomenal dude, gets this opportunity now to be the head coach. Um, but they also have to figure out what's going to happen with Kyrie. And like even myself, when I look at it, I'm not totally sure what the right path forward is because there's a lot of baggage that's come with Kyrie. And you know, interestingly, this year, by all accounts, was absolutely incredible behind the scenes so invested like i think he and the organization had had great conversations before the year and it was bearing fruit when it comes to just like the day-to-day um interaction if you're the nets what do you what what are you looking at jeff to kind of determine what's the best path forward right now for you as an organization especially as it comes to Kyrie? well i think the main thing no matter And I'll get to Kyrie in a second, but the main thing is to keep Durant at at this focal point Mm. where he doesn't 
feel like he has to share the spotlight. Like we're playing through you. You're our guy. Keep making every right play. Keep setting the right tone from an unselfish standpoint, from a defensive standpoint, because to me, he's so good that if you have enough shooting around him and enough versatility, like we were talking about with the Celtics, they can be dangerous. Now, last year, they got swept by the Nets Mm -hmm. and they were not healthy, but that was a competitive, I mean, they could have won game one, should have won game yep. one. Kyrie sort of went for an ill-advised gamble, steal, and they got beat by a layup. Um, these other games were, like, very tight. So yeah. I, I, I think keeping Durant in this frame of mind, focal point, you know, get Harris back. We missed last year. Curry missed the start of this year. Um, they both, you know – haven't quite found exactly what they're looking for, although Curry has really shot it exceptionally well at times. And then they got to try to bolster their, you know, front court. You know, Claxton has done a good job, but is injury prone, and I think they need a little bit more there. Is Simmons going to give you anything, uh, or is he just a backup center for a few minutes? Um, That has to be answered. And then, you know, what you're talking about with Irving. I think Irving... His talent is well documented. His skill is well documented. His uh, propensity for finding himself in the midst of issues mm-hmm. is also well documented. And I think every organization has to weigh uh, the talent versus trouble ratio. To me, if they're dead set on winning a championship, he's going to be a part of it. He has proven that at the highest stage, he can compete with the very, very best at his position. Um, Or they're going to have to make a trade that brings back maybe not quite as good a player, but a player that can play very well and complement Durant. So I think, you know, they have three-pronged thing or four prongs, health, uh, Simmons, size, and Irving. And I think, Irving, if they're if if the goal this year is to win a championship, Irving is going to be a part of it. Mm, yeah, that's well laid out. I couldn't agree more on the KD aspect of it too. Like, and if you think about it, there is a model there, right? Like, even the way it's different, they're different players. But even the way Dallas plays, like they don't have some obvious second star. Everything runs through Luca, kind of surrounded by shooting and and gritty, versatile guys, and you're able to be competitive with anybody. Um, and it feels like you could probably do something similar as long as Durant remains, as you said, the focal point. Yeah. I mean, Doncic, his usage rate is like astronomical. <laughs> yeah. <Man. laughs> and, 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 and frankly, I don't know if they're as good as they were last year, even with Hardaway back because they lost Brunson. Yeah. You know, last year they had Dinwiddie as a third guard this year. He's starting. I mean, like the load on Doncic is severe i mean every single night but you know it it is on durant without irving too so um it's just you know durant just isn't like that young but yeah yeah. man he looked i mean he's just again you have these guys who are supremely gifted everybody in the nba is gifted then you have the level that we were talking about with curry Durant's in that group. Like the guy is just, you know, he's just remarkable and he's remarkable on a consistent basis. And that's what separates players. Mm. You know, anybody can have a good night. Uh, The pretty good guys can do it two out of five nights. The very good, you know, the pretty, you know, the good guys do it three out of five, the very good do it four out of five. And there's Durant and that small pocket of guys who basically come through on a nightly basis against the very best in their profession in the world. And it's remarkable to watch. It is incredible to watch. And so are you, Jeff. So are you, damn it. You're incredible to watch on yeah, TV. I don't know about that. I I'm couldn't here. even get my Zoom to work on this thing. <laughs> it worked out for us, though. <laughs> it worked out. Coach, you are the best. Uh, we so appreciate you being so good to the pod and 
sharing your stories and your insights um, and your perfectly framed Zoom. So thank you for uh, for being on, man. You got it. Take care, guys. All right. Thanks, Thanks, Jeff. (laughs)